Well, I just I really wanted to discuss um, a lot of the things that we've we've all been reading in Emmerich's story and latter days, and also I was reading the From Hell dialogue, and that, that gave me some ideas for some questions. And I thought maybe we'd start out by uh, discussing how we came to spirituality. Uh, I guess like. I guess your take is pretty different from mine. Um, I would think so. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll give a little background of, of where I'm coming from. Right. Uh, I was does born. It, does it, everybody know that Steve does a book called Everwinds? Everwinds. Well, Everwinds was canceled. I'm doing Awakening okay. Comics. Does everybody know that Steve's not doing Everwinds? Anymore? <laughs> <laughs> You're saying it's so well, the character's will, will still be around, so don't worry. But, um, yeah, so I was born to two scientists. And uh, for for most of my, my younger life, I didn't believe in any type of God at all, because my parents didn't. Uh, but they, my father died when I was really young also. But I think they, having two parents, as two, two parents who were scientists, uh, kind of instilled in me, like, a a sense of um, always testing your beliefs and uh, always questioning, uh, questioning the world, questioning everything, experimenting basically. And when I, as I get older, I guess into my teen years or, or so, I started feeling a, a pull. And I guess by the time I was in college, I was more strongly pulled. And then by the time I got out of college. Um, what I, w I guess what I would define as God or w whatever it is grabbed me and I've just been trying to find out what God is ever since and uh, and yeah uh, I've been in my comics that's pretty much what my comics are all about is trying to find that answer uh, and I'm not sure that that uh, we can really know what God is. Do you think you've gotten any closer? I do think so, but as as you find out, the more the more answers uh, are solved, the more questions you get. And it's, I don't know. I'm I'm, con I'm continually reevaluating what I believe and refining and, and trying to figure out figure out what I believe. And I, I might even say that, that I don't necessarily believe anything because I, can, I really can only believe what's in front of me because I can't even believe my memories because memories are so subjective and something that you remember from 10 years ago like an event that you shared with someone you might remember completely differently. So I think that there's a God. And... To say I think I think that there's God kind of implies that well I think I think so it means that you're not sure but I don't mean it that way I mean do you hope so well yes yes I like that part, yeah. <laughs> I, and I know that uh, I'll give you I'll give you a second wait, to think about it and just say how many people here believe in God. Okay. About 50%? Yeah. Uh, I know that this is going to get a reaction, but it's more like I feel that there's a God. <laughs> well, I, I think that there's a God, so I think we are on the same page. Well, two sides of the same page. But spirituality for me is an intuitive thing. And it's... It's it's I'm I'm at the point where I'm just about certain or or I am certain, but I couldn't I couldn't explain it rationally. Just can't see it. It's hard to believe. You can't see it. And so I guess where where are you coming from? I mean, I believe I'm a I believe you wrote. Yeah. <laughs> I believe you wrote that uh, you you started you your interest in the Bible started when you were researching Rick's story. So. Yeah, basically, um, what I set out to do 
in service, in that part of service, which I knew was, was way up ahead at the time, was to do uh, a really cutting satire of the Bible and people who believed in the Bible. Because I came from the, I think we all came from the same background, uh, being either in the generation that I'm in or the next generation after it or the one that preceded us. <clears throat> if you can't prove it verifiably in an experimental laboratory sense, where anybody can demonstrably prove that something is, then that thing isn't until it is. Uh, you know, perfect example being neutrino, where in the scientific community it was a good theory, but they didn't, you know, it, start, it started being theorized in the early 1900s and wasn't uh, given the Nobel Prize confirmation until I think the 1980s. Because until then, it was just a nice story. It's like, yeah, that works. You know, If those things actually exist, that answers a lot of questions. But we can't prove that they exist. This ties in with the Sarah's. I'm not going give to away, give away the surprises on it. So anyway, I set out to do this, this scathing satire of the Bible and, and people who believe stuff. And the, the, the approach that I was going to take was that... Uh, Cerebus was going to get the Bible, but tell a completely different story out of it from what people conventionally believe, which stayed pretty much intact. What I thought that I had to do, first of all, starting with Rick's story, was that I wanted to write it uh, in the 17th century English, just as a, as a writing discipline, and because it's far more interesting in the 17th century English than when they try to update the Bible Let's make it modern and relevant. And it's like, let's take all the poetry out of it until it's just this leaden prose. So anyway, I figured, OK, what I have to do is get a copy of the Bible. And there was a, a Bible store, as a matter of fact, just a block from the studio, uh, Canadian Bible Society. And I went in and said, uh, I need a Bible. And uh, she said, which one do you want? <laughs> what do you mean, which one do I want? You know, there's, there's a Bible. What, you know. There's only one, right? It's like, well, do you want the, the revised version? Do you want the King James version? Do you want this version? Do you want uh, modern English? I'm looking at this rack of Bibles that they've got, and first of all, I'm boggled by the idea that there's all these different variations. You know, should there be like one Bible? How could, you know, you can't have uh, 18 different theories of relativity. You've got, you've got one. That's, that's how you know it's a, it's a working hypothesis. And I happened to look down and I saw 1611 on the spine of one of them. And I thought, you know, that's either the product code or maybe that's the year that it came out. And I said, what's this one? What's the 1611? And she said, oh, that's the King James Version. That's the original translation of the Bible from 1611. People don't read that anymore. We keep that around. People buy that as a souvenir. And I thought right away, no, I think this is the one that I want. Because not speaking Greek to read the, uh, the Gospels in the original form and not, uh, not knowing uh, Aramaic to read the Gospels in, in that other version and not knowing Hebrew, the earliest version of the Bible that I, that I could read, of the Torah, that was one of the first things I learned. You don't call it the, the Bible, you know, it's... It, the Old Testament and New Testament. No, it's the Torah and the Gospel. But anyway, I bought it and, and started reading it and immediately went, oh, this is what was missing. You know, I kept looking for, uh, you know, working through Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, and all the various philosophers and, you know, find this guy and find the guy further back that he was interested in and the guy further back that he was interested in or who is the guy that they're pointing to, you know, who is Dostoevsky pointing up at? And sometimes I'd find out, okay, it's, I don't consider that guy up there. Dostoevsky might have, but I look at Dostoevsky and I go, no, you're up there. He's a little strange. Norman Mailer, I put like way up there. Hemingway, I put way down here. But everybody else put Hemingway way up here and Mailer down here. And I go like, this isn't pointing at anything. 
I, or, or I'm missing something here because I keep trying to build a, a scaffold. And as, as soon as I started reading the Bible, I went, oh, okay, well, this is it. You know, this is, this is where it all came from. These are the original mysteries, the stories that we're supposed to understand. And these people have wandered so many hundreds of miles away from it that, you know, you can't even, you can't even know what it is that, that we were intended to know out of this. So, essentially I went, okay, that's, that's all in the future. Just read it, learn how to do the language. Learn the 17th century language so that you can do Rick's book. I decided to make Rick a Jesus figure in the book and to say, okay, I, I want the, the language to sound right, get the rhythm of the, of the writing, and there's a definite rhythm to the Bible. And uh, once I've got that, then what I'll do is build like Rick's story, illustrating, you know, exactly what I ended up doing in, in Rick's story. This is a tavern, but over a period of time that gets lost, and it becomes, no, this was this revelation that came to this person. Uh, because I think that's, of my generation, that was the view of, uh, as an example, Jesus. Uh, the, the cynicism, which you the atheist would call realism, uh, looks at that and says, um, I don't think all of these things happen. I think that there's like mythologies mixed in here. This is, there's the eternal champion. There's all of these different Jungian things. This is, this is the both the substrata and the overarching thing. And apart from that, this is just the sort of thing that we believed when we weren't very sophisticated. Now, but my reaction was completely different from that. Uh, so essentially, I, I learned how, as best I could, to write 17th century English and to try and write Rick's story so that you knew what was going on in the story because you could see the pictures and you knew it was Cerebus and Rick. But to make it into that conventional belief that over a period of time it coalesces into a, uh, what would be a good word for it, a, uh, uh, a pr not a pragmatism, a, uh, help me here, Steve. Uh, well, I don't want to use the wrong word. Okay. Well, I haven't got the right one, so. And with, no, no. It, it coalesces into a Dogma. That's what I was saying. Oh, okay. Well, you should have said it. Well, well I wasn't sure if I was right or not. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, that it, it coalesces into this dogma that has nothing to do with what actually happened. Do, do people? Do you agree that that's a pretty conventional acceptance of the Gospels that this all got changed over two thousand years? Yeah. Something happened, but what we got passed down wasn't it? Okay. See, I, I don't think that that's the case. Um, well, I'd like to get back to that one more a little later. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking up way too much time for the first question. So let me just go real fast and say, what I ended up doing was, was saying, okay, I will address the actual Bible after I do the Rick story thing with going home in between. And I thought, okay, I have to understand what the Bible is actually saying what I think it's actually saying, so that I can write this strange twist that Cerebus is going to put on it when he reads it. And as I read it, and start, and I was reading, you know, I was reading the Bible, uh, I would read a complete book of the books of Moshe, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five uh, that make up the Pentateuch. I would read the complete book on Sunday, and then the following Sunday, the next book, and I ended up reading the Pentateuch out loud to myself, basically ten times, between the time that I picked up the Bible and when it came time for service to do his commentary. What happened was that I got so involved in, what do I think this is actually saying, that I went, no, this is the story. Cerebus will say what I think this is actually saying because that's so far at variance with what everybody thinks that this is saying 
that that will that will accomplish the same the same literary effect, which is what I was driving at, to say. Um, That's another question I'll save for later. Oh, <laughs> well, we took care of that one. We can just take that right out of the box. <laughs> Do you understand what uh, what I'm explaining to you? Wait. So, in other words, you read the Bible and you interpreted, and you so it's your interpretation. Right. Okay. And uh, at at excruciating length. I think all Cerebus fans can be agreed. It's like, Dave, this is really, you know, this is more than I possibly could want to know about this. And uh, it is very, very interesting to me became the problem. This was far more interesting to me than anything else that I could do in the book. To do it accurately and to say, okay, I can either go across the whole Pentateuch, the first five books, and take individual chapters that I think I understand, or I can try to understand the first 38 to 35, however many I'm going to get up to, and really tax everybody's patience. But be able, be able to say, no, for complete creative freedom, this is far more important to me than anything else that I could possibly put into the end of this book. And you know my contribution as a commentary, as an example, when it, when I when I'm almost finished, you know, I will I will be turning the Take microphone over. Okay. In when it, when I read the Pentateuch aloud, when I read the books of Moshe, I don't call Yuhu Yuhu. It's I, there's no pronunciation for Y H W H. It says in the 1611 King James, Lord God. So I say that. Although I think it's blasphemous. I think to say that there is a God and a Lord God is what they say in the Quran, what was revealed to Muhammad, joining gods with God, which is blasphemy. But at the same time, it's God's book. You know, he let them put Lord God in there from 1611 on. I'm not going to try and come up with my own variation on it or some less uh, insulting term than you who when I'm reading the Pentateuch. I tried it, and it's like, no, what I'm doing in Cerebus is commentaries. This is scripture. I can say this is what I read when I read scripture. There's a long history of commentaries. But the Jews particularly very definitely kept the two things separate. There's commentaries and there's scripture. And the Torah has been handed down intact. Uh, word perfect with obvious words missing for at least 2,000 years once they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, previous to that, it was believed, as a lot of us had, did believe earlier, that it was a game of broken telephone. The scriptures came down in this fractured sort of way, and the Torah that we read today in 1940 is not remotely like the Torah uh, that they read the earliest one they had at the time was like from the 1400s. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls blew <coughs> out of the water. It had all of the books of the prophets and the law, and all of them were word perfect to the Torah that we have today. Back to you, Steve. Uh, well, I kind of left out uh, when I was uh, trying to say where I'm coming from. Everybody, everybody who's a, I guess, a Cerebite, quote unquote, uh, knows that you're into the three monotheistic faiths: you know, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And uh, wrong order. Sorry. No, it's, uh, that's important because it means be beginning, middle, and end. The beginnings the Torah, the middle Judaism, is the Gospels, Christianity, Islam, and then Islam. Yeah. Okay. God, uh, Muhammad was God's last messenger. Is my Belief. And that, that saves me in a lot of ways when you're doing really controversial commentary. It's like the fact that you know somebody might mistake you for a prophet. It's like, not possible. That ended at 632. When Muhammad died, that was the end of the revelations. Everything now is, I, I think, uh, each individual should be reading the scriptures and trying to understand it in their own terms. If you don't agree with my conclusions, 
That's fine, but I really think that everybody should be reading. I apologize for interrupting. That's fine. Uh, where I'm coming from is pretty much completely different. I mean, I do have a very strong interest in Christianity and in Jesus. Jesus is very interesting to me. But I'm also interested in uh, Eastern uh, religions and uh, like Hinduism and Buddhism and a little bit what you might call paganism, um, you know, Native American beliefs and whatnot. But I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call my beliefs like new, new age or something because that, that term kind of gives me the creeps. But uh, I, do, I guess I do come at it from a very different perspective than you do, and I just wanted to start out saying that so that everybody knows where we're coming from. Um, and I, my beliefs are kind of, I, again, I, w I don't know if I should use the word beliefs or not, but my thoughts come from a variety of sources, and I kind of take what I think works for me. And I don't know if that's an unusual approach or not, but your approach is pretty unusual too, because there aren't that many people who will, who who um, follow all three phases simultaneously. You know? I'm the only one I know. <laughs> so I'll, from that, I'll go to my first question, which is about Rick's story. And in the int introduction to Rick's story, you wrote that. Um, you wanted to see you wanted to see what the traumatic events of um, you know what happened with Jaka would have on on a likable character like Rick, and uh, and when he comes back to Cerebus's world, we see that he's totally unbalanced, or maybe he's not totally unbalanced in the beginning, but he gets there, and uh, which for Cerebus fans is really saying something to say that they think a character is unbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> but we see that you know, as you said, Ray becomes a Jesus figure. We see that he, in some way, he really is a true prophet because what he says comes to pass. So I was just wondering if, if you're making some kind of comment on prophets on the type of personality it takes to be a prophet or to have been a prophet. If, you know, if there's no longer any more profits to be had, but yeah, I think that, I think we don't know that. I mean, part of the uh, the whole mystique of the prophet is it's very difficult to me to get a mental image of Isaiah. I mean, it's it's sixty sixty some odd chapters of some of the, the most overwhelming prose and ideas underlying it. Um, but I don't get a sense of a person because I, I, my belief is that uh, these are revelations that came to these individuals. And I see it as a, as a debate between God and Yuhu God acted out through the prophets. The, the ability to discern um, accurately with, with any degree of, of perfection, in my opinion, on our part do, does not exist. I, I can read Isaiah and I can say, I think this is you. And then I think this is the point where God starts to answer. Her. And this is actual narration this part. There are bridging parts. Um, this is, this part is really interesting, but it, it, you might have to know exactly what was going on in Jerusalem in the year 750 BC, and then it would be Bafo material. Like if, if you knew what was going on, boy, oh boy, that chapter is a killer, but it's useless now. I mean, it really doesn't, uh, doesn't say anything to anyone. With, uh, with Jesus, I mean, there's a, to me, there's also the division between uh, the synoptic Jesus of the synoptic Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who to me I could be entirely wrong in this. I think is you who is Jesus, and that the Jesus of John is God's Jesus. 
because it's the three and the one. You know, he, she, and it, and he. And, you know, it, it would be a, uh, an irresistible deal that God could present to you. you know, you're saying you're God. I'm saying you're not God. I'm saying I'm God. You're, you're, you're somebody that I created. Let's have a guy come along. You get three books and I get one. And I bet I end up winning. Yours will have contradictory elements. The stories won't match up. And a centerpiece of Judaism is unless three accounts agree, then you haven't gotten anywhere close to the truth. So God's proposing at the outset, let's base this on a lie, in a Judaic sense, a demonstrable lie. I will have my one book, and my Jesus, but my Jesus will become completely different from your Jesus. And let's see if this endures. And it, it did, in my view, because it wasn't a lie. It was, the accounts didn't match up perfectly, but everything that Jesus said was a perfect uh, barometer Litmus, litmus test of whether you recognize good or evil. In my view, when I when I read it, it was uh, I would read the things that, that he was saying, and I'd go, "That's wrong." You know, he's he's saying that, but I think that that's wrong. I think it's a you're supposed to come to scripture that way. Whether whether you're talking about the Torah or the Gospels or the Quran. It's going to be a lot of trouble with the Muslims. Like, I, you know, I'm really putting my life on the line here because I think in the Quran the, the dialogues continue. Uh, we we spoke to you. We we have said to you. Have we not always said? If the point of the Quran is that there's one God, why is it always we? And I think it's because again, you know, it's 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 a real fine-tuned debate between. God and you who, and you're supposed to read the surahs of the Quran and go, this is wrong. The stuff that the, that the Muslims are doing in the Middle East when they wage jihad, that's you who's stuff. And there are, there are verses, individual verses in the Quran that one after the other just absolutely contradict each other. And it's like, you who says her thing, and it's usually blood and, and pound them and they're being unfaithful and they, you know, we have, we have to, we have to pound the infidel and destroy the infidel and, and all this stuff because they're the unfaithful ones. It's you who are really acting out this hatred of the Jews who wouldn't do what she said. And God on the sidelines going, no, I created them. They're good. You're the one with the problem. So in a sense, your, your approach to scripture is, you're looking at it and you're you're determining what you agree with and what what the other side is saying. Or right, which which is basically agreeing with what you said, which I think is a, a given of uh, our belief, a, a given of each person, whether they're they're embarking on finding God or have an interest in spirituality that you don't know. Uh, it is impossible, as an example, if you read the books of Moshe, it is impossible to run a society based on the law of Moshe. If you read those actual laws, they're, they're really incoherent things. There's some good stuff in there, but a lot of it is incoherent, and very little is covered. It's the same reason that uh, the Sharia law in Muslim in Islam, doesn't work. I mean, I read the Quran, you know, every Sunday. Now that I'm, I'm done with the with the commentaries, I read something from the Torah, a complete book, something from the Gospels or Paul's commentaries, and either several chapters or a lengthy chapter from the Quran. And you can't run a society that way. It's uh, the things that it's demanding are incoherent. And in Islam, they've endured to this time. 
I'll cut off your hands and feet on either side. Do you think that's God? Do you think God's talking about cutting out people, people's tongues? That people should be stoned to death for adultery? That, you know, and it's like we know better. And I think that's God's point. You know, it may take a long time because the authorities that you put over yourselves, which is also your choice, you know, each, each culture, each society puts people over them. Uh, the Jews chose to have a king when they had God's prophets. Bad trade. You know, here we're going to have a king and, and we'll deal with his son and then his son's son and his son's son's son. And it's like, that's not how it goes. That's not how God does it. You'll know the guy because, as you said, the perfect uh, centerpiece of the prophet. If what he says comes to pass, he's a prophet. But if he says it today and it's not going to come to pass for 200 years, that's a tough one. I mean, it, it, the, uh, the rabbis have, have, have certainly you know, expended a lot of effort to uh, create this idea that the, the, the Torah has been uh, changed uh, in order to make the prophecies sound right. Like they'll say, okay, we've got this book that we know is from 750 B.C., and it's predicting things that happened in 350 B.C. And it's like, well, they just changed it when they got to 350 B.C. It's like, no, well, they didn't. It came to pass. But it didn't happen right away. That's, that's my opinion. Um, how's, it, how's this striking you? Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's get to, your, get to your question. I'm just trying to keep up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is this interesting? I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Something occurred to me after reading Rick's story. I guess it was it was probably a while after reading, maybe a couple of years. Uh, it occurred to me that you, it's possible to look at the story, and I don't know if you intended it to be read this way, but it's possible to look at the story um, <laughs> with the cerebus representing you and Rick representing certain portions of your reader.